um, so yeah, today we're talking about composting at <clears throat> a larger scale, not just backyard. Um, usually we think of backyard gardening, composting as being like a cubic yard in size. Uh, for ag operations, because of the volume of material usually within that, we are talking much larger scale and the systems that are uh, more adapted to that. So that's the, the goal of today. Um, as far as composting goes, um, I really like to, I read an article um, earlier um, this week and I, I like the, the gentleman's de definition of how composting. It said, uh, composting is the, the art of working with decay process in an economical way. And I think that really applies to farming because composting is a rather laborious um, system and it has to be economical um, to make it worth doing. So uh, we try and keep that in mind as we talk about all the different systems. As far as composting itself, it is truly just a method to speed up what is already a natural um, process of decomposition. And we do that with composting. Uh, for the most part, most systems are aerobic. There are some um, anaerobic systems as well. I'm not gonna touch on those because they're not as easy to implement on a farm. Uh, the last thing I wanna just say is, especially at a larger scale, there is no one right way to do compost on a farm. Um, it really is important to look at your farm, look at your time, all the things we're gonna talk about today and decide one, if it's worth composting and then two, how to implement that. So we're gonna just do a broad overview today. Um, the other thing to keep in mind about uh, comp uh, composting is that it truly is simply trying to take what is a natural system that occurs in the soil all the time. Um, and that is where we have the plants growing and all this organic material being added to the soil. In this case, we're adding it to a compost pile, but it's all the bacteria and fungi um, that are naturally in that soil that then slowly decompose the leaves or grass or whatever else we put into the pile. In some of our systems, we're 100% dependent on those microbes. In more windrow or pile systems, you probably will also see a lot of these other creatures joining in that composting uh, and uh, making their way into the compost pile. And there's nothing wrong with that um, as far as the composting system itself. So today I'm gonna to do quick, very quick overview of rules and regs. Um, and then we'll talk about composting methods. And then we'll look at more uh, of the more typical farm composting system of windrow or pile of composting basics. Then we'll finish up talking about how to make sure the compost is good quality and how to apply that and use it. So very quickly, uh, there are a lot of rules that apply to composting at federal, state and local levels. Um, at the federal level, um, there's a number of programs that have very specific requirements for utilizing compost and or making compost. One of those is the organic program. And so if you are an organic farmer you, there, and you want to compost and or you want to buy and purchase compost, um, you do need to pay attention to those regulations and all of the guidance of interpretation that have occurred since the implementation of those rules back in 2000. So um, and that can be a whole program in itself, um, but just be aware of that. The other one that's more important to just general farming, especially if you are into vegetable or produce farming, and that is the FISMA rules. And there again, there are very specific um, guidelines for making compost uh, and the quality that is required and utilizing compost, especially if you are growing root crops, those things that are coming into direct contact with that soil. And the main reason for that is uh, compost, if done wrong, can actually harbor some human pathogens that could affect us. Uh, and we've seen some samples of that where salmonella or something like that has um, gotten into the food system via lettuce or some other means and uh, comes uh, from the soil sometimes um, as, as the way it gets uh, contaminated. 
Uh, the Illinois EPA has a lot to do with composting on a larger scale and defining that larger scale depends on uh, your farm and your system and a lot of factors that again could be a whole program in itself. Just be aware that that you should check in with the Illinois EPA. Usually the land bureau is the one you're going to be dealing with to see do I or do I not need permits. Um, very basically, and there's a lot more rules and so forth than this, um, you're not required to get a composting par permit for larger scale composting on a farm if you're using your own manure um, and you're not adding things to the compost pile that come from off farms. So you couldn't accept food waste from the local school, something like that. The finished compost also can't be transported off farm, and so it needs to be used in your fields. Uh, the site on your farm, um, uh, or the where it's going to be low, is composted, has to be on your actual farm property, and it has to be operated by you um, as the farmer, as the main manager of that site. The um, farm also has to produce crops, which the compost can then go onto those fields. And then lastly, there are restrictions as far as the amount of land of your property that can be in the compost production, uh, just to try and make sure it doesn't expand into a larger composting system. Um, so the, just be aware that um, visiting with the EPA is probably a good idea before you set up a larger system to make sure that all the rules are in compliance, because they will inspect <laughs> if they find that you're composting. Beyond that, um, counties and municipalities and cities have their own rules. Uh, about five years ago, Chicago and Cook County broadened their definitions of compost and made it easier for community gardens and urban farms to compost, which is a great thing. But do read up on those rules and regs. They have some very specific things to make sure you comply. And one of the biggest ones is that there is a permit system that is needed if you're going to utilize a livestock waste. And that can be from chickens, goats, uh, whatever you might have uh, with, uh, uh, to utilize. So uh, just read up on those and um, contact the city if you have any questions. Usually the environmental department is the one you contact. If you're not in Chicago, uh, but uh, any other counties, then uh, this is a website, the Illinois Food Scrap Coalition, who does a really nice job of trying to keep up to date with all the regulations. So they list the various municipalities within Cook County, and then what are some of their uh, composting uh, regulations. Still, it is always best to simply call the environment department in your town, find out what the rules are so that you can comply with those. So that's the rules. Um, Beyond that, let's look at some composting systems that can be utilized on farm. Uh, one of them is vermicomposting. Uh, there's some debate whether that's really composting or not, but it is very effective and the outcome is an, a really excellent product of wood worm castings that are highly um, uh, synthesized and are very easily dissolved within the soil and therefore the nutrients are very quickly released into the soil. It's not that difficult to worm compost. Um, at a small scale, you can do it on your own using a bin like this. Um, there's plenty of instructions all over the web on how to build a worm bin. Um, the most important part of all the worm bins is to use the right kind of worm and that is a red wiggler worm. They're more adapted to um, being stressed and living at higher temperatures than our normal earthworms. Um, vermicompost is considered to be a cold composting system, which means it's not going to kill uh, diseases and weed seeds and that kind of thing, although the worms do take care of a number of weed seeds. But for the most part, it's considered a static composting system, and therefore it does not meet the standards for utilizing it in uh, food production farming. Uh, if you're going to use vermicompost, then it does need to go through other steps to basically um, pasteurize it um, to kill off diseases. But it is a very good um, system. Um, you can make your own vermicomposting beds, it's not too difficult. Um, you can buy them. All right, um, there are a number of um, vermicomposting farms in the Chicago area where literally um, there's, that's all they do and are producing larger amounts of, of vermicompost.
Uh, another way to compost on farm that is a little bit less um, intensive because uh, it is uh, the, uh, the piles or windrows basically stay in place. And so you're not turning them as much as in other systems. And it's called an aerated static pile and or passively aerated windrow systems. So basically what that means is usually the piles are covered because you have to watch and maintain moisture content. Oftentimes they're in a building um, or covered with a building to uh, protect them and monitor that moisture. Then the way these are set up is that there are pipes placed down um, underneath where the compost, the materials would go. And those can be on grade, just regular pipes. If it is in a building, there are um, diagrams and, and blueprints and so forth to actually build it. So it is an in, within the um, concrete to have that air being blown up through those systems. And in many ways that makes it a little bit easier to get the compost in and out. So you can plan long-term and do that. But basically what it is, is you have these systems with pipes running down um, through that compost pile. And then there's two different ways that the mechanical aeration goes on. One is a positive pressure where the air is blown in and circulates up through that pile uh, and, and leaves the pile then. Or it is a negative pressure where it's actually vacuumed out and then it actually will go through a filter to take out some of the odors, especially when the compost is fresh. There could potentially be some odors since it's so static. Um, and they can be set up as one or other. Um, the preferred way would be to have a reverse system that depending on what's happening in the pile, you could um, change and uh, adapt to that. So that's our static piles. Um, and here's just some examples up here of you know, very simple static piles, much more intense um, static piles um, and homemade systems um, utilizing what they already had as far as bins and so forth. <clears throat> fairly easy to set up, fairly easy to monitor, um, but there are some things that can go wrong, um, especially if you ever got into things like food waste and that kind of thing. Um, so keep that in mind. Uh, do these static piles never get turned? Uh, they are turned less than windrow or um, regular bin or pile uh, compost. So whatever design you have, make sure that you can get in and turn that material if necessary. So a front end loader needs to be, the width of the bins need to be wide enough to um, utilize that. If you do set it up in a building, uh, there are companies. Uh, one of them is Green Mountain Technology. This is one of their stirrers that can go into the top of that pile and mix it without disturbing um, all the pipes and so forth below. So uh, there can be a substantial money investment or a very low key investment of uh, a tractor you already have. Um, for this kind of system, usually it has it does require a fairly large area in your farm because uh, you do have to have an area where you're receiving that material, holding it until it's ready to go into the compost pile. Then you would have those sites where you have the uh, windrows or uh, piles set up um, that will be there for a couple of months in order to compost. So. It, um, uh, it's important to have a, a large enough area to accommodate all the materials that are going to come in. And then once the compost has um, matured, then it needs to be cured. And that usually is about another month process where we try not to have that contaminated by anything else. And then once that's done, you need an area to store that compost unless you have the ability to immediately put that out um, anytime during the year. If you've got pastures or something like that, it could go on. So. Um, the area is it, it's really dependent on how much material you're going to have to compost, the equipment you have, can you turn around with your equipment, that kind of thing. But it does take more than just one small area. If you don't have much area, there are what we call in-vessel composting systems that are much smaller footprint on your farm. And these use um, a, a motor to turn the compost. Um, they can be expensive because they've been using electricity, although some of these run on the solar systems now. Um, it tends to be a little bit more rapid of a system because the compost tends to be turned on a much more regular basis. 
And the environment within these containers is designed to monitor and maintain temperatures, moisture, and airflow. So it's a, a more a perfect setup for decomposition to occur. And these can be very simple and tiny from a barrel that you set up uh, on a, uh, your own property. Um, I've seen cement mixers used like this one. And again, there's a lot of commercial technology available. I'm not recommending one or the other, but Green Mountain Technologies is one of the better known uh, for this. And you can see that these systems can get quite large um, and fairly easy to use uh, to compost uh, larger amounts of materials. And then lastly, the one we often think about when we think about composting is simply putting the material on the ground. Uh, for the most part, sometimes it can be on a concrete slab uh, where it's either set up in a windrow set system. And for this, you're gonna have a lot of material in order to do this. And or it's put into bins uh, that uh, where the size would be no more than about five by five by uh, four or five feet tall. Um, in order to have a maximum compost bin. And again, it's best if those bins can be accessible by your tractors or, or skid um, stirs um, in order to uh, be able to turn the material on a regular basis. If it is outdoors, um, then tarps are probably um, going to be needed as well, especially in the spring, because if the compost pile gets too wet, you'll definitely have problems with runoff and contamination of streams and so forth and or odor. The other thing, I know we have some <clears throat> greenhouse folks and greenhouses are another way uh, that you, where you can compost and it's beneficial because compost piles give off heat. And so especially in the winter, some greenhouses will intentionally put composting systems in the inside of the, compo uh, in the, inside of the um, greenhouses to add some warmth and decrease heating costs. So those are four major systems. Um, the windrow system um, is uh, very effective. I said, as you've got a large amount of material, um, you can use the pile system with your bins, as I just showed you, but you also can keep it really simple and truly just pile the materials um, in layers and then turn it as appropriate. Uh, and again, this, the amount of area required for this just depends on how much material you have and uh, what equipment you have. A skid stir that doesn't take as much um, area to turn around. If you've got a front end loading uh, tractor, you're gonna need a little bit more space to be able to get in, lift that material up and basically drop it back down in the pile as how we usually turn the piles in the easiest way um, in order to uh, keep the comp uh, decomposition process going. And again, so um, if you've got uh, windrows and or piles, then uh, you will need an area to just gather all the material you're gonna put into the uh, compost pile or windrow. Um, you're gonna need area to put those out and be able to turn with those. Once that has composted, then you are gonna also still need that area to cure the compost and then store whatever is done uh, before you put it out on a field. I've added this to the notes, so I'm not going to go through it. It's from a um, publication out of Ohio that's really nice. And it just goes through and compares the cost and time and those kinds of things between the um, couple different systems I've talked about. So if you're interested in, take a look at that publication and the charts that I've included in that. Some other things to think about is, do you have time to compost? Um, I mean, overall composting is a fairly easy, simple process, but to do it well and get quality compost at the end, and especially if you're following FISMA rules, then it does require a lot more time because you do have to, one, understand the science of what's going on in that pile to know what to do, um, especially if, if a, a problem develops. Um, two, you do have to be much more careful about what materials go into the pile. And we'll talk about that in a minute, um, trying to maintain a carbon nitrogen ratio. Uh, most importantly, the time comes in from checking the pile on a regular basis for the temperature and monitoring that temperature, as well as the air, um, amount of air that's in the pile. And of course the turning process um, takes time and the curing process is simply 
um, making sure you've got the space and location to be able to leave that pile until it's totally done uh, curing. So um, the composting site then, um, where it could be on the farm and things to think about is uh, compost, uh, if it's done super well and you maintain the heat within the pile, can potentially be turned over in about three months. If you're not on top of it quite so much, it could take as much as long as eight months to actually you know, go through that whole process. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. The quality will still probably be there at the end, but just make sure you have whatever site you've chosen is a site that can be there for the year. Uh, and, and not just a month or two that you think you'll be composting that material. The other important things is that it, it, you have to be, obviously needs to be accessible to your tractors or skidsters or whatever you're gonna to use to turn it. Um, it should be in a dry area. You don't wanna put this where it water ponds um, for environmental reasons. That's a good reason to get the EPA out there if it's being, um, if there's too much moisture and or if there's too much of a slope that the runoff could potentially end up in a stream or river. You are using equipment. You don't want it to get stuck. So the, usually a, a pad is formed either with dirt or limestone or something else to try and maintain, make sure that it, in the middle of spring when it's a little more wet, you can get in and do, uh, turn the uh, pile if you need to. Um, minimizing leachate and runoff is really critical. Um, a lot of times a berm is put at the lower edge of that slope to prevent any runoff from getting off of your property. Um, beyond that, uh, permanent grass filter strips are used beyond that to absorb any nutrients um, before they go into a stream or river. And of course, enough space. We've talked about um, needing uh, the ability to turn around and have the multiple or uh, different uh, uh, stages uh, of composting. And <clears throat> another thing to look at is do you have the right equipment? Because if you're doing the wind or pile system, you are going to have to turn the pile. It's very important. Uh, and we'll talk about how often you do that in a minute. So you can use on-farm equipment you already have, especially if you have a front-end loader or a skidster, they work fine on turning the piles. If you have a much larger volume material, you might consider investing into a windrow turner. Um, it's the most efficient way to maintain uh, a composting system but there's a lot of different windrow turners and be careful on which ones you choose. And we can go into that um, individually or um, on a different uh, webinar sometime, but be careful in choosing those. Beyond that, depending on the quality and what you're gonna do with that compost, you may need screens to screen out the bigger stuff. And of course you're gonna have, you are going to apply it to your farmland. So you need some way to spread that. Uh, you may already have a manure spreader or something, so that would work. And then lastly, you're going to need some monitoring equipment, and that's usually a temperature probe and an aeration monitor uh, are the two most critical pieces for that. I provided you this. It's the Art and Science of Composting. It's an uh, older publication, but it's still, in my opinion, one of the better publications. So um, please take a look at that, especially if you're going to do um, pile composting. In that publication, it has a nice little chart that I've provided you also in the notes um, of the conditions that we want to maintain in the pile uh, in order to have it hot compost and to quickly compost and to have the least amount of problems possible. And so we will go through all of these individually as to how do you do that and maintain it and monitor it. But I just wanted to point out that to you that that um, table is there. So um, let's look at some of the steps of creating that compost pile. Now that you've got your site and you know, the equipment already, uh, then you have to decide what's going to go into the pile. If you're going to hot compost, it's really important to pay attention to the ratio between the amount of carbon and nitrogen materials that are in the pile. Bacteria basically uh, utilize carbon and nitrogen at a ratio of about 30 to one. They need the carbon uh, for their energy source and they use the nitrogen as a, a, a way of making proteins and so forth and multiplying and so forth in, in the pile. So a ratio of 31 is what we go for. And you can see in this graph that if we have that maintain that ratio of 30 to one um, and we 
we're going to hit those temperatures that we need to hot compost much more easily. And it will also decrease the number of days it takes to actually decompose the material in that pile. If it's less than that, uh, uh, 30, um, then nitrogen is going to be released in that pile and you can end up with odors of ammonia and those kinds of uh, problems. If it's greater than 30, um, too much leaves or straw um, in the pile, then nitrogen is gonna be so tied up that it's gonna slow down the decomposition process and it will take much longer, as you can see over here, um, to decompose. So the nitrogen, carbon nitrogen ratio is important. Um, large scale composters actually um, measure all this before it goes into the pile. There are calculators to determine the actual e exact tonnage to go into a pile. If you really get into composting, you can do that. Otherwise, you're gonna try and match it up as best as you can. And with experience, you'll get better at this. Um, the brown materials and their carbon source materials would be things that you would have in a hand, uh, animal bedding, uh, uh, straw, corn stalks perhaps. Well, that should say leaves, not weaves, wow. <laughs> um, straw dust uh, without any, um, uh, uh, anything to protect the wood. Uh, wood chips are a possibility. Um, even things like cardboard um, or paper can be shredded and, and put into a compost pile. Your green sources are your nitrogen sources. Um, that would be the manure, uh, separate from that bedding material, uh, which is more carbon. Uh, anything like spoiled hay uh, or spoiled straw would be okay. Uh, you could actually green chop your cover crops and compost them. Um, anything from uh, packing shed waste, uh, it, it, things as you know, the extra leaves and that kind of thing you take off would be go into the compost pile. Uh, food scraps from your farm um, can go into the pile as well. Did want to point out though, um, if you are a livestock farmer or have any interest, there are ways to compost the mortalities on your farm of animals, but those are whole separate rules and different way to compost. So this would not work for that. And we can talk uh, about how to do that separately. Uh, next thing you need to pay attention to in composting, we had that question just before um, we started and that is what all the twigs, leaves, larger things, especially if they are uh, wood, uh, how do you uh, shred those, break them up and so forth to make them smaller? Preferably you'd want them to be about a one inch diameter and so you can use chopper shredders, uh, mowers in order to break those things up, even leaves. If you can go run them over with a mower and break them up a little bit more, the better. And the main reason for that is bacteria are, in order to decompose that material, have to cover that material. So the more surface area you give them to cover, the harder they're going to grow, uh, more they're going to grow and harder they're going to work to decompose it faster. So, and this is just another diagram demonstrating that, that a smaller diameter reaches those temperatures for decomposition much faster and at the right temperatures. If there are a lot, a lot of big stuff in there, it's much harder and slower to decompose material. It will decompose, you will get compost eventually, it just won't be in that short time period. Um, you gotta measure moisture. Um, if you become really good, um, large scale composters are pretty good at identifying uh, how, what, 30, uh, uh, compost feels at, I like it, between uh, 46 and 65 degrees moisture. Otherwise, there are a lot of different moisture meters available. You stick it into the pile and fairly easy to measure that. There are oven way, uh, other ways to measure it by um, uh, slowly um, heating up the soil and measuring the weight before and after to determine the percentage. Um, Any more, all these kinds of equipment are also electronic, which means you can put them into your pile and then in, look on your phone to see, oh, wow, that pile's at whatever moisture and you don't have to be out there constantly checking it. Temperature is another one that you can use an old, um, a long compost uh, thermometer. These are usually about two to three feet, sometimes five feet long, depending on which one you get. Uh, they have a gauge at the top. Uh, and again, there are electronic versions of these now that you put in and uh, look on your phone to see, oh wow, the temperature's changing, so therefore I need to do something. Temperature is important because that's telling us that the decomposition is occurring. 
Uh, decomposition is most rapid um, at temperatures between 130 and 150. That temperature is actually coming from the bacteria as they work and consume things. And um, that encourages them to even multiply more. So um, when everything's going well in the pile, you will hit those temperatures fairly quickly. Um, oftentimes 12 hours to 24 hours later, uh, putting the pile together, you'll reach those temperatures. The other advantage of these temperatures is that it kills off um, many of the pathogens that are bacteria, uh, viruses and those kinds of pathogens that are in the, are in the material. Um, it also kills off a lot of the weed seeds, especially the smaller weed seeds. Large weed seeds like cockerburn, maybe not, but definitely smaller weed seeds. You can get the temperature too high. Anything above 160, we try to avoid. At that point, you would turn the pile, um, add some water to try and lower that temperature. A good compost system is actually going to do a lot of fluctuating of up and down temperatures. And when that temperature is going down, that's a hint that we're going to turn the compost pile. And eventually, though, it's going to keep going down and it will not go back up to that 130, 150 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's when you know your compost is ready to go into that curing stage where we're going to let it sit and stabilize. And you can see that the bacteria counts are going to go down. It's not, there's not as many sugars and proteins and things for them to eat. Um, and so um, uh, the temperatures will not rebound at some point in the composting process. The temperatures are really important, especially for FSMA rules and organic rules, because um, they do reduce pathogens that can potentially be harmful to humans. And so that is why if you're going to compost to utilize on vegetables and those kinds of um, crops, you are going to have to keep records. Officially, especially with the windrow system, the temperatures have to be maintained at or above 131 degrees Fahrenheit for three days after you turn the pile. And it has to be turned at least five times during that composting process. So there's very specific requirements to meet uh, for that. Another requirement for things to go well is that there has to be enough oxygen. Uh, composting is an aerobic system. Our air has about 21% oxygen in it. And so we need a constant influx of oxygen. If we do everything right in the composting system, that heat in the center acts like a furnace. So the heat is going to draw air up out of the pile. Whoa, went too fast. And um, bring air into the bottom of that pile. And so it's a natural ventilation system if we can get that heat working properly. If there's not enough air, microbes will actually die back and go dormant. So anything less than 6% oxygen can be a problem in a compost pile and oftentimes leads to odor. And so uh, it is something we need to monitor. The idea would be to have between 10 and 16% oxygen at the center of that pile at all times. And we do that by turning and or by the density of the materials that we put in, a chopping it uh, correct sizes. So um, I've talked a couple times about turning the pile and when do you turn and how do you turn. There's two main times you're going to turn. We just talked about one of them, and that is when that temperature goes up and then it comes back down. Well, that means the bacteria at the center of that pile have run out of food, and so they need new food. And by turning the pile, you're mixing it and putting uh, more material in the center of the pile that they can consume, heat that pile back up. And that will take you know, numerous times during the composting process. And we're going to do, tell that by the temperature. And we'll talk about it. Um, and that's why that's so important. The other reason you might have to turn the pile is if you do have an odor. <laughs> um, if there's, the pile gets too moist, there's not enough air in the pile, uh, usually you will get that odor of like a rotten egg smell. And the only way to get rid of it is to turn the pile within 24 hours, usually that will go away and um, you can go back to your regular composting. But um, the amount of times we turn the pile does make a difference in how fast you could, um, the piles decompose. Um, uh, if you are turning the pile every three days, which is about where the temperatures go, <laughs> if you've got everything perfect, 
then that will decompose quite quickly. If it's every 10 days, it will be even slower. And if it's every th um, 30 days or not at all, it could take a year for that pile to actually decompose um, completely. Uh, for our large scale composters using windrows, um, what, uh, an average of what they do um, based on some surveys that were done a while back is that they will, in the first three to five days, they will turn that pile every day, trying to get as much bacteria spread as widely throughout that pile and mixing it. For the next three to four weeks, they're gonna turn it two to three times during the week, depending on all the conditions we just talked about, temperature, air, air moisture, and so forth. Once most of that decomposition has occurred, about week five, then they will slow down to about once a week. All those are variable depending on the environmental conditions and what's in the pile, et cetera. Those are just guidelines, um, something to think about. pH is important in um, decomposition. Uh, bacteria prefer a more slightly acidic, a neutral pH. So trying to keep the pH at that range is important. Depending on the materials you put into the pile and or what's happening in the pile, you might have to add some limestone. Uh, usually it's finer grade limestone in order to moderate that pH to around seven. So if you've done everything right in that 30 days to 60 days, you have finished compost and now it's important to cure the compost. And all that means is basically letting it set um, because most of the proteins and other things the bacteria are eating have been decomposed. And now um, back, uh, fungi and actinomycetes tend to take over. And they're the ones who are actually, um, with their hyphae, uh, go, basically help um, bring those particles together to then look like soil aggregates by the time compost is completely finished. Um, it is important to not let that pile go anaerobic when it's curing, which means you may have to turn it. Uh, just depending on moisture. So you, you can't just leave it out there and not look at it. The other really important thing is it's basically a pasteurized material at that point, not uh, with most pathogens having been killed. So you do want to make sure it can't get recontaminated. Oftentimes uh, composters will cover that to prevent you know, bird droppings and that kind of thing into the pile, particularly if it's gonna go back into something like a greenhouse potting soil that becomes even more important. Um, how do you know you're done curing um, that? That is really dependent on um, the, how uh, the quality of compost that you need. Um, if it's going back onto the field, it's not quite as important as it using it other times. Um, the other reason to cure uh, compost is because of the last chemicals that need to be modified and, and um, uh, uh, used up within the composting system. Um, so in fresh compost that's not been cured, there's a lot of organic acids that can prevent seeds from germinating. There's ammonium, uh, ammonia and ethylene oxide that can hurt the roots if you use compost too early um, and it's not being completely cured. If you had a high nitrogen ratio, a carbon nitrogen ratio, and use it in a garden, the compost itself will continue decomposing and then take nitrogen out of the soil and your plants may end up being deficient in nitrogen by using immature compost. So those are the main reasons things we're looking at. Well, how do we know compost is finished? Uh, simple ways you can do this uh, for yourself would be a bag test, put some compost in a bag, seal it for a day or two, open it up. If it smells um, like rotten eggs, it's, it's not finished curing. If it smells good like soil, it's done and you can utilize it. Um, I prefer to do a germination test. Cucumbers are really sensitive to those organic acids. Um, simply take some compost, put a couple of cucumber seeds in there. If they germinate, it's good to go. So, you can do more sophisticated tests. And especially if it's going back into greenhouse, uh, it's probably a better way to test for fit, compost being finished. And for that, you would you, uh, one way to do it would be to use a Silovita testing um, uh, unit. Um, these are rather expensive. So that's why it, for higher end compost, uh, it makes more sense. But um, it's a, a simple uh, color changing um, tablet that are put in the jar with the compost. 
to monitor uh, CO2 and ammonia in the compost. If you really want to know quality of uh, the compost, um, then you can have it professionally analyzed. The Composting Council does have a seal of testing assurance that you can send a sample off to and they will verify the quality of the compost. And um, especially if you ever dig it into selling the compost, they can, um, this will assist in grading the compost, whether it's like grade A, grade B or grade C compost and therefore quality and therefore the amount of money you can ask for that compost. So once a, the compost is uh, cured, um, you may or may not need to screen it. If you are simply gonna put it back into a field, um, the fact that there are larger pieces in there may not be a real problem. So you may not need to screen it. But if you're gonna use it for something like potting soil in a greenhouse, then yeah, you are probably gonna to need to <laughs> cure that or screen that um, to get out the bigger pieces. Those bigger pieces then can go back into the compost pile that you have um, uh, started uh, in another place. A lot of different ways to screen. If you don't have much, hand screens work fine, just you know, labor intensive. You can make your own screen uh, turning system, not too difficult. Or you can make a larger, um, more motorized screening system and or purchase one. Um, usually the screening systems are probably the most expensive piece of equipment you're gonna buy. Uh, and be careful how you buy one. Um, some clog really easily. You, you definitely wanna do some research before purchasing a screen of a larger scale, just to give you a heads up on that. Okay, so we've got this nice screen material or compost material. Um, how do we know how much to put into the soil? Uh, you can um, get the analysis done and use the soil test as a basis. You would not get a soil test, you would use a composting um, analysis to determine the nutrient content. Most composts, especially if they are with yard waste only um, or green material, um, weeds and uh, uh, leaves and that kind of thing, um, would be a very low analysis, usually a one, one, one. So it, a lot of the benefits of composting are for the things they add to creating better structure within soil um, and better tilth within soil uh, rather than a immediate um, infusion of nutrients. Um, in fact, compost is considered a slow release fertilizer. In other words, the material has to continue decomposing in the soil to release all the nutrients that are within it. And that can take a long time. And so in general, a real general rule is that if you know how much, uh, you can estimate how much nitrogen you have, and that in the first year, only about 10 to 25% of that nitrogen will actually be available to the plants. And then every single year, other portions of that will become available, same way for phosphorus potassium. And so when doing fertilizer recommendations and utilizing compost, you do have to work that out for several years to um, take a, account of the benefit of that compost having been added. Uh, usually to determine those kinds of rates and amounts, uh, you would look at publications on organic farming and how to determine fertilizer rates for those organic uh, systems. Uh, they take this into account all the time because composting is such a critical part of their nutrients. Then you need to apply compost to your fields and depending on the size of your composting system and the size of your fields, um, lots of equipment out there, the small little manure, uh, manure uh, compost spreaders uh, or larger manure and compost spreaders um, are, uh, can be found fairly readily uh, in auctions and so forth. Um, on average, um, uh, one recommendation would be to apply about two inches of compost over an acre to give some added fertility and soil benefits. And that would be equivalent to about 150 tons or about 300 cubic yards just to do one acre. So uh, volume wise, it becomes, uh, it needs a, you need a lot of compost in order to depend on that as a nutrient. Otherwise, other ways to use compost um, is in your own vegetable garden. Uh, 
Again, about two inches of compost worked into the top four to six inches, adds a lot of um, soil amendment benefits and nutrient benefits to your garden. Sometimes compost can work really well as a mulch, um, especially around perennials. Uh, you never use more than about four inches of that uh, in, in any given location. And uh, especially around trees, if you're gonna use it as a mulch, keep it away from that trunk. Um, lastly, one thing that compost is really beneficial on is if you're trying to maintain a quality lawn without too much fertilizer. Uh, if you can do a core aeration um, to have some of the holes there uh, where the roots can then expand and, and uh, be prolific uh, and then apply the compost. That compost will fill in those holes and make it a lot easier for those roots to grow uh, with more air and nutrients in that compost. There are actually systems that do both. They will chorierate and then apply this, the compost right after it. Um, greenhouse uh, uh, golf courses and so forth use that. Um, but you can rent them sometimes uh, as well. But they, it, compost, it does wonders for a lawn uh, if you have no other use for it. Just a couple other things to be heads up about is that um, compost can be sold as a fertilizer if it's got a grade uh, assigned to it. It can be sold as a soil amendment. Um, and there are laws to just dictate whether or not you can sell it that way. And they could just sell it as a product with no guarantee of anything on it. Um, so if you got into the business of selling, um, check the permits first, make sure you can do that. Um, but just be aware that your claims on that compost, uh, you might be legally held to a standard of the fertilizer law or the soil amendment law. So um, you can say compost available, um, just don't guarantee the quality if you're selling, you're giving it away as a product. Um, uh, if you're going to actually sell it, this is not compost, this is just the straight manure. Just be careful of the claims you're making is the point of that. Um, last couple things on a larger scale, uh, there are opportunities if you are composting, depending on what you're doing and how you're doing it to get carbon credits for it. It has not been an explosive response to that and is still not the easiest uh, way to get carbon credit. I gave you links to two different articles by Sally Brown. She's a soil scientist, one of the world uh, US experts on composting out of um, University of Washington. Uh, she wrote two articles in BioCycle Bio Cycle really recently about that. And uh, down the road, especially with the new legislation, um, this will probably pick up, but um, uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, that's uh, maybe someday you can actually get double uh, benefits of composting. Well, if I've scared you off and you don't want to compost at all, but you still want compost, um, yeah, I would encourage you to compost. Use that um, yard waste or uh, other things from your farm and it has such a benefit to your farm. But if you don't have the time, the space, whatever else, do be aware that there are a number of large scale composters in the Chicago area and it, um, they produce quality compost and they do test it. So you can ask them for the, the great, the analysis of that compost and they deliver by the truck. So uh, keep that in mind. If you go to the uh, composting council and uh, look for the composting map, um, you can find those locations uh, that I have certified compost. So uh, lunch and learn is such a quick overview. And usually when we're doing farm composting, it's an entire day workshop and sometimes three days, especially if we do on-site um, analysis and that kind of thing. But um, I hope that I introduced some ideas to you, uh, let you think about composting. I hope that you will consider doing it. Um, it is important to know the rules and regs um, so you don't get caught by those. Um, choose a system that fits with you and your farm and what you're growing and how much resources you have. The site location is very critical um, from an environmental standpoint and an ease of access standpoint. So choose that wisely. The feedstocks are important if you want to hot compost and quickly compost. If you are just interested in composting, cold composting, then um, though that mixture is not quite so important, but it will take longer to compost, keep that in mind. In order to 
quality compost, hot composting, it does take time. You do have to monitor temperature. You do have to monitor air, et cetera. Uh, so take that into consideration and in how you decide to compost. But overall, um, compost is a, a wonderful soil amendment. Number one amendment that's recommended by soil scientists to improve soil. So I would strongly encourage you to um, compost. And um, that's my last slide. So we, uh, I, my chat box is not open. So if you've been putting chats there, I've forgotten about it. I'm sorry about that. Um, but if you have any um, questions, you, you know, unmute yourself and feel free to ask him. Um, and, and as well as um, if you have any questions once you read through the material later on, or if you decide to actually compost, you know, just give me a call and I'd be glad to talk through the system with you. Well, any we have to Oh, go right ahead. Am I echoing? I was finally able to get my video in things. I had to log out, log in, turn my phone off, do a few things. But um, Dorothy Rosier, appreciate your time on this. I got uh, more out of this than I planned on. Thank you. Any questions? Just to clarify, I will forward um, the attachments that Ellen sent to me this morning, as well as a copy of the recording. Um, Questions? Well, I want to thank Ellen for your excellent webinar, your expertise and ability to present complex concepts clearly is really invaluable and so appreciated. The fact that I could understand this is amazing. Um, and uh, again, like I said, I'll send those materials out to you as well as a copy of the recording once it's been reviewed by Ellen and approved. And then um, final note before we say goodbye to Ellen. Oh, let me stop. It looks like we have another chat. Vicki said, thank you very much. Thank and, you. Uh, we hope that you join us for our next Lunch and Learn webinar. Um, the topic's gonna be on carbon credits and what we need to know. And that is gonna be Wednesday, January 26th. We'll send out information on that. Again, um, any final questions? Okay. We appreciate, you yes, we appreciate you taking your time this afternoon to be with us. Sorry for those beginning technical difficulties, but um, we so appreciate you. Have a great rest of your day and happy Thanksgiving to all.